It's Medicosis Perfectionalis, aka the Rolls Royce of medical education, and today we continue our nerve physiology series. In the previous video, we have talked about the structure of the neuron. Today, it's time to talk about the strength duration curve. You plot the strength of the stimulus on the y-axis and the stimulus duration or the minimal time on the x-axis. This is my Butamus physiology playlist from number one until video 25. We talked about cell membrane physiology, osmosis, etc. From 25 to 40, it was the autonomic nervous system. And from 40 onwards, we're talking here about the nerve physiology. Let me answer the question of the previous videos. Which nerve fiber type is the most affected by pressure? Is it type A fibers, type B fibers, or type C fibers? And the answer here is, um, what will pressure cause? Uh, when you press on me, it can cause pressure hypoxia. Pressure hypoxia, okay. Therefore, which one is gonna be affected the most? Whoever is most metabolically active and thickest. Therefore, the correct answer is A fibers. Let's review Medicosis Nuggets of Medicine. Nugget number one, why do we need the action potential? Because the action potential is life. In your own body, the nerve impulse is unidirectional. It goes this way only. How about the opposite way? Experimentally in the lab, it's possible, but in your body, it does not happen. Where does the nerve impulse start? It does not start in the soma. It starts in the axon HELOC because this is the most excitable part of the axon. Nugget number four, during rest, this is the resting membrane potential. The cell is in the polarized state. What the flu does that mean? It means that the inside is more negative compared to the outside. During activation or unactivation, you have reversal of polarity. You get the opposite. We call this depolarization or reversal of polarization. The inside of the membrane becomes positive because sodium is coming in. Sodium is positive. When sodium comes in, the membrane, the inside of the membrane becomes positive. This is the action potential depolarization. In the previous video, we have compared between type A fibers, type B fibers, and type C fibers. A, thick and myelinated. B, thin and myelinated. C, thinnest and unmyelinated. It's neither thick nor myelinated. It's the worst of the worst. But it's cheap. Nugget number five, local anesthetics will affect type C fibers the most. Why? Because they are thin and they have no myelin. So if you inject local anesthetic, it will be easy for them to diffuse throughout the membrane. But look at this. Oh, it takes a lot of time for me to diffuse across this thick nerve fiber. Therefore, C is the most affected followed by B, followed by type A. Pain fibers tend to be of the C type. Nugget number six, you will be affected by hypoxia and pressure hypoxia the most if you are very metabolically active and far away from the artery. Type A is a classic example. It is very active, metabolically speaking, and it's far away from the vasa nervosa. Nugget number seven, let's put these two facts together. Who is more susceptible to local anesthetics? C, followed by B, followed by A. How about pressure or hypoxia? A, followed by B, followed by C. It is paramount that you master the structure of the neuron, was discussed before. The types of neurons are either multipolar, bipolar, or pseudo-unipolar. How do I know it? You look at the soma, and then from within the soma. How many branches are emerging? Let's count them. This is one. Yeah, I even count this one. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. This is multipolar. How about this one? One and two, that's bipolar. How about this one? Just one, that's why it's unipolar. But it's a kind of a, yeah, it's pseudo-unipolar. It reminds me of the pseudo-stratified epithelium. The multipolar neurons are subdivided into three categories. You have the motor neurons of the spinal cord, they look like this. You have the pyramidal cells of the hippocampus and the Purkinje cells of the cerebellum. The pyramidal cells are like this. Oh, look at the look at this triangle. It's a freaking pyramid. But look at this. That's a Purkinje. Think of a clown whose name is Purkinje and he's wearing a big funny wig. Types of electricity. Well, the electricity that you studied in physics was mostly about electrons. Yeah, you remember the battery and positive and negative? This is electron flow. But in your body, we're talking about ions, electrolytes, baby, sodium, chloride, potassium, calcium, etc. Which one is faster, you think? Of course, the electrons. The electricity flows from the electrical generator to your home very quickly. Way, 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 way faster than the flow of electricity in your nerves. The electric current is divided in into DC and AC. DC is also known as the galvanic. Thank you, Luigi Galvani. The alternative is called the Faradic. Thank you, Michael Faraday. Galvani came before Faraday. 
Excitability is the ability of living tissue to respond to stimuli. Examples of excitable tissue, nerves and muscles. Stimulus is a sudden, sudden change in the environment leading to excitation of the living organism. Types of stimuli are numerous. Here we're talking about electrical stimulation. Let's study the neuron, shall we? Sure, let's use a stimulus. I will use the electrical stimulus. But why did you use the electrical stimulus? Because it mimics nature. It mimics the natural stimuli in your body, which is ionic in character, causing electrical stimulation. Second, electricity is measurable and controllable. Third, electricity is benign, it will not damage the nerve. And you can repeat the test as many a time as you want. What are the factors affecting the effectiveness of electrical stimuli? One, the rate of the rise of the intensity. How fast is it rising? If you give a stimulus that's rapidly rising in intensity, you will get a robust response. But if it's slowly rising, you will not get a response because the nerve will get used to it. And this is called accommodation. Number two, strength. A certain sufficient amplitude is needed to stimulate the nerve. Third, duration. A certain duration is needed to stimulate or to excite the nerve. Let's couple two and three together and form the strength duration curve. Doctors suck at math and the doofus who's talking to you is no exception. So let's talk about the basic idea of hand graphs. Okay, you have direct correlation and inverse correlation. Easy enough. Direct correlation, we're going this way or this way. Inverse, we're going the other way. What do you mean by direct correlation? As B increases, A also increases. Okay. And then you have two shapes, the linear and the exponential. Linear goes like this, A equals X times B. X could be one, for example, so A equals B. So if B is one, A will be one. If B increased to two, A will increase to two. Three, three, etc. Or this could be two. So A equals 2B. So now when B is 1, A is 2. Okay, and then when B is 2, A is 4. So it's still gonna be linear, but a different kind of linear with a different slope. How about the exponential? This is A equals B to the power of X. Conversely, inverse correlations are either linear or logarithmic. This is A equals 1 over B or 1 over XB, but this is A equals 1 over B to the power of X. So let's talk about the strength duration curve. What's the first thing that we should talk about with any graph? Oh, what's on the y-axis, what's on the x-axis? Okay, so we're talking about the relation between the strength of the stimulus and the duration of the stimulus. In other words, it's that relationship between the strength of the stimulus and the minimal time needed to excite the freaking nerve. From this graph right here, do you think this is directly proportional or inversely proportional? Any doofus will say that this is inversely proportional. Excellent. Another question. As the strength of the stimulus increases, the duration needed to excite the nerve will, any doofus will say, decreases because they are inversely related. Trust but verify. Let me give a stimulus of X intensity and look at the duration. Let's call it Y. Now, what's going to happen when the strength increases from X to 2X? Oh, what's... Oh, look at this. The duration decreased because they are inversely related. Easy peasy. Why didn't the curve touch the ends? You see here, there is a gap here and there is a gap here, which means within limits. The strength of the stimulus is inversely related to the duration needed to excite the nerve within limits. When you give a stronger stimulus, you get a shorter time to respond, and then even stronger, even shorter, even stronger, and then you will hit the critical point beyond which no shortening of duration is going to happen. Which parameter should we depict on the x-axis? Should we use the duration or should we use the minimal time? Minimal time is better. But why medicosis? Let me explain. Let's say that you gave a stimulus and the strength was X and you got the response in about two milliseconds. Okay, now time is gonna pass three milliseconds, four milliseconds, and the nerve is still excited. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, now which number should I use? Should I use two, three, four, five, seven, or ten? You should use the minimal time. You should use your two. The strength duration curve. These bullet points are very important. If you are taking a physiology test, make sure to know your stuff inside, out, and backwards. Okay, what's the strength duration curve? We are depicting the relation between the strength of the stimulus and the minimal time needed 
to excite the freaking nerve. Okay, what do you see here? I see inverse correlation. What do you mean? The stronger the stimulus, the shorter the time, or the shorter the minimal time, needed to generate a response. Okay, what's a Rio base? Uh, right, what does Rio mean? Electricity. What does base mean? The base, the lowest thing ever. So this is the lowest stimulus. It's the minimal or the lowest current intensity that can excite the nerve. If you go lower than this, the nerve is not going to be excited. The nerve is not going to respond. This is the lowest of the low, the Rio base. You are not la creme de la creme, you are the lowest of the low. The lowest strength, the lowest intensity capable of exciting the nerve. Next, what is utilization time? It's the time of the Rio base. It's the time utilized by the Rio base, by the threshold. To understand the threshold, imagine that I am jumping from over a bar like this. Okay, that's the threshold. All right. If I jump lower than this, I will hit it. I, I have to jump over it. Okay, how far? Should I go this way or should I go this way? It doesn't matter. As long as you are above the threshold, you will be excited. But how about below the threshold? Shut up. Next, what is a sub-threshold? Oh, beneath the threshold. You can call it a sub-minimal stimulus. This is a stimulus whose intensity is lower than the threshold. No kidding. It does not produce an action potential. You don't say. It causes ah, something so we called a local response or a local excitatory state, but this is not an action potential because the action potential follows the all or none law. If you give me enough electricity, aka a real base, I will give you an action potential. Anything below this, I'm not playing with you. So here are the studies that we are performing on your nerve. We can call this electromyography or EMG. Okay, all right. First of all, uh, we want to excite the nerve, not the skin. Like we're trying to target the nerve. I got you. But the skin has some resistance. So you have two choices. Choice number one, to remove the patient's skin in order to perform the freaking test. F me. Choice number two, you can double the intensity to account for and to counteract the intensity of the skin. Oh, so instead of using the real base, use double real base. Double the threshold to counteract and to account for the skin resistance. And then we have another definition called chronaxia. I love this word. What does chrono mean? It means time. That's why you have chronotropic. That's why we have chronic diseases. That's why we have chronological order. That's why we have lichen simplex chronicus and erythema chronica migrans. How many examples do I need to give you before you get the point? So what are you trying to say? I'm trying to say that chronaxi is the time. It's not the stimulus strength. Shut up. It's the time. Chronic means time. Chronaxi, it's the time. Time of what? Of double the ray base. And why do you need double ray base? To account for the skin resistance. You would care about trail base if you are a freaking professor with some woke theories. But, but if you're dealing with flesh and blood human beings in the real world, you should care about the double ray base and its duration, which is called chronaxi. So you take that double rear base and then follow it until you hit the curve. And then the point of intersection, oh yeah, intersection with the duration, this is called chronaxi, this point right here. Why do you care about chronaxi? It's a measure of nerve excitability. The greater the nerve excitability, the shorter the chronaxi, the shorter the time needed to excite the freaking nerve. Please note that chronaxi of nerve fibers is less than chronaxi of muscle fibers on average. What is membrane potential? It's the potential difference across the membrane. No kidding. Do you need to go to class to learn this? So what do you mean the potential difference across the membrane? It's between the outside surface of the membrane and the inside surface of the membrane. The membrane potential is responsible for excitability. Okay, where should we put the electrodes? Should we put them like this, one in front of the other? No, this will lead to electrical interference. So why, how should you put it? You should put one on the outside and one on the inside to measure the potential difference across the membrane. Okay, I have another question. Uh, should we use a galvanometer? Shut up. Galvanometer is for goofs. I'm sorry, forgive my language. Why not, medicosis? Because the galvanometer has a needle or an arrow like this. And this needle is made of a freaking metal or any substance. And this substance has mass and therefore has inertia. And therefore, by the time the nerve impulse is going from here to here, okay, the arrow will not have time to come back and then shift forwards again, which will give you false readings. So what should we use? We should use the cathode ray oscilloscope to measure those oscillations up and down, up and down.
forms of membrane potential. During rest, we will call it the resting membrane potential, which is the potential of the membrane during rest. <laughs> Unbelievable. Upon stimulation, well, it depends. If you give me enough intensity of the stimulus, aka threshold, I will give you an action potential. But if you give me a sub-threshold, I'll give you something local response. And this is nerve physiology in a nutshell. If you understand the resting membrane potential, the action potential and the local response, it's gonna be a piece of cake. Remember that during rest, the inside is negative, but upon excitation or activation or depolarization or reversal of polarization, the inside becomes positive because sodium is coming in. So here is me during rest, potassium is being pumped outwards and the inside is negative. But then during depolarization, the sodium is coming in. Okay. And the inside is becoming more positive. And then let's go back. Repolarization, so pump the potassium out. But sometimes I go too far, negative eight instead of negative 70. And then the inward rectifying. Potassium channel is gonna dump some potassium into the cell and then going back to negative 70. Clinical tie, let's quickly review multiple sclerosis. You know that the nervous system is central and peripheral. Central brain and spinal cord, peripheral cranial nerves and spinal nerves, except the optic nerve. The optic nerve is central, by the way. I have a video on my channel called The Eye is Part of the CNS. It was an epic video with epic implications. Because your eye and your optic nerve literally bulged out of your brain, specifically the diencephalon, during embryological development. Multiple sclerosis is a disease that demyelinates the central nervous system and it will demyelinate your optic nerve. And that's why the patient can suffer from optic nerve problems. Hashtag optic neuritis. Medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. This is myelin. Who makes myelin in the central nervous system is the oligodendrocytes. Don't forget cranial nerves 1 and 2 come from the forebrain. The olfactory comes from the telencephalon, the optic emerges from the diencephalon. And therefore the eye and the optic nerve are parts of the CNS that have bulged forwards during embryology. Multiple sclerosis is a disease that damages your central nervous system and therefore it will damage the optic nerve and the retina of the eye. You will get retrobulbar neuritis, papillitis, or optic freaking neuritis. How about Guillain-Barré syndrome? Guillain-Barré is a demyelination of the peripheral nervous system. And since the optic nerve is central, Guillain-Barré will not touch the optic nerve, proving to you that the optic nerve is central, not peripheral. Myelin is made of fat with some proteins. That's why it appears white. The white matter has myelin. The gray matter is unmyelinated. Therefore, if you do an MRI of the brain of a patient with multiple sclerosis, which area is going to be affected? Oh, the myelin, because it's a demyelination syndrome. So the myelin is damaged. You will see the problems centrally, not on the edges. What would you call this atrocious gunk? I will call them oligoclonal bands, because remember the oligodendrocytes? Yeah, we can also call them plaques, or plaques, as they say in the UK. Multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune disease. You have nasty, stinking autoantibodies destroying your myelin. Your oligodendrocytes are toast. It's also an inflammatory condition. It's a demyelination condition of the central nervous system. You lose white matter. White matter will appear more grayish on MRI. What is the central nervous system? Brain, spinal cord, and the optic nerve. So you'll get brain problems, nystagmus, ataxia, internuclear ophthalmoplegia, diplopia, scanning speech, intention tremors. Spinal cord, you get paraparesis or weakness, sensory manifestation affecting the trunk or the extremities, and a neurogenic bladder, and the famous positive Lermite sign. You, as a doctor, passively flex the patient's neck forwards and the patient will feel electric shock-like sensations shooting down the spine. The optic nerve is toast, acute optic neuritis, painful unilateral visual loss. Contrast that with central retinal artery occlusion. It was a painless unilateral loss of vision. And because your optic nerve is toast, you will suffer from something called afferent pupillary defect and you can get the famous Marcus gun pupil. What should happen when I shine light on this eye? Both eyes should constrict their pupils. What should happen when I put the flashlight on this eye? Both should experience meiosis. But if you swing the flashlight real quick, in normal people you'll see meiosis bilaterally. 
But if I have an afferent pupillary defect, oh, this pupil will dilate because the optic nerve is toast and when you swing quickly, the cortex did not have enough time to cover for the insufficiency and the incompetence of the optic nerve. Multiple sclerosis and the rule of twos. Everything here is two. It's an autoimmune disease. It's also inflammatory. It has sensory defects and motor deficits. It's relapsing and remitting over time and space. What the flip does that mean? The patient will come to you, doctor, doctor, today my left arm cannot move. Yesterday and last week I was fine. However, six months ago, my right eye had a problem. Before that, I was fine. However, one year ago, my bladder was a little crazy. Relapsing and remitting over time and space. It reminds me of the migratory thrombophlebitis. It comes here and then disappears, and comes here and then disappears, and then comes here and disappears. It's, all, it's also similar to migratory arthritis. Let's do an MRI. Oligoclonal bands. Oh, these are demyelination bands. Loss of white matter, no kidding. Central part of the brain, you don't say, and reactive gliosis. Gliosis is a non-specific reaction to any injury or any toxin or any anything. Let's do lumbar puncture. Increase IgG. Oh, you mean like you have tons of plasma cells and lymphocytes and they are secreting tons of antibodies and IgG is one of the antibodies? Thank you. Increase myelin basic protein. Here is the thing. You know, any factory, you have raw materials coming in and end products going out. The modern basic proteins are here. You can consider them raw materials. If you're not making myelin or if you're destroying the myelin, what's going to happen to what's before it? It's going to increase. Let's review multiple sclerosis from Picmonic. Multiple sclerosis is depicted here by the multiple skull roses. It is more common in women, especially in their 20s and 30s. It's commoner in Northern Europeans. The mechanism is unknown, or you can call it idiopathic, which means we are idiots and we cannot figure out the pathology. It is associated with HLA-DRB1. So HLA, here's the hula. DRB1, DR is the doctor. B, here's a B, and one, here's the one. What is going on? It's autoimmune demyelination. Here is the auto, in moon, demyelinating the moon. Does it affect central or peripheral nervous system? Central, baby. Is myelin part of the white matter or the gray matter? White matter. It's also a T cell mediated inflammation and here are the tennis balls. I will leave you with two questions. Here is the first question. Match from column A to column B. And the second question. If the amount of calcium in the extracellular fluid decreased, the chronaxi will increase, decrease, or not change. Let me know the answer in the comment section. You'll find the correct answers in the next video. All of the previous questions and answers are in previous videos in this glorious playlist called Physiology. If you want to take your neuro knowledge to the next level, get my CNS Pharmacology course. It has 20 videos and notes and cases that teach you about opiates, anesthetics, stimulants, sedatives and hypnotics, anti-epileptics, antidepressants, antipsychotics, and anti-Parkinsonian agents. Download it today at medicosisperfectionalis.com. Most doctors are doofuses when it comes to neuro, so please, master your craft. You can also download my antibiotics course, comes with 40 videos. For the next 19 students, you can get a 25% discount on everything on my website. Just use promo code SAVE25. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell, and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my courses. Go to Picmonic for more than a thousand animated medical mnemonics. Thank you for watching. As always, be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfect Snellus, where medicine makes perfect sense.